there are so many important stories. And as I was watching that story of Ruth again, it reminded me that in the command for Shavuot in Leviticus 23, it has a stipulation. It talks about everything that happens during Shavuot, from the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf, count off seven full weeks, where we are now. But it concludes this, like this is in verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And I'm sure this is one of the reasons that the feast is connected to Ruth. There are many reasons. I think everyone knows this. I was, I was really amazed. I was listening to a, I don't know what you call it, a podcast something where there's a lady in Israel named Sandra Barras and a fellow named Tommy Waller who goes over there quite a bit and works in the vineyards. And then her, Sandra has an organization called Christian Friends of Israel Communities. And uh, her Christian representative, Kimberly Trout, the three of them had a discussion. And in this discussion, something came out that really blew my mind. And that is, and I'm curious what you think, that most Christians do not know the relationship between Shavuot and Pentecost. Do you think that's true? They're absolutely the same thing. And they were talking about many Christians think that Pentecost was something that just happened at Acts 2, and they don't realize that this was something that Israel had been doing for thousands of years. Shavuot just is the plural for week. Shavuot is a week. Shavuot is weeks. Pentecost just means 50. And of course, when you count these days down, you can say it's seven weeks in a day, or you can say it's 50. So they're exactly the same thing. And I'm just going to talk about a few things here. And I realize after eating, I might have to do a dance or a special entertainment to keep people awake. But in Acts 2, the passage everyone here is probably well aware of, in the King James, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. And the Greek there is sum pluru, which means to completely fulfill. And why would they say that? Why would you say when the day had fully come? I think you can all guess. What had they been doing? They had been counting the omer. And so when the day had fully come, they had counted all the way through. They were all together in one place. This is a euphemism for being in the temple. For some reason, people get them in the upper room. How many of you know the upper room would have a hard time with 3,000 people? And so they're all together in this one place. And real briefly, I think you all know the offering at Passover, the first feast, is what? A lamb? And what's the bread? It's matzah. The unleavened bread and the lamb represent whom? They re represent Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Now at Shavuot, you offer two leavened loaves, a burnt offering of seven male lambs and a bull and two rams, a goat, two male, a lot of offerings. And these are all waved before the Lord. What's the significance of offering matzah at Passover and leavened bread at Shavuot? If matzah represents Yeshua, what do the leavened loaves represent? They represent us. They are us. This is very important. And again, it's one of the things that came out in that beautiful little story of Ruth. Ruth gave herself as an offering. And whenever we give ourselves as offerings, we're not perfect. We have leaven in us. But that's the offering. And the, who could eat the leavened loaves? Just the priests. Only the priests. So what does that mean? If, if the offering is us and only the priests can eat it, it means that 
while we are the offering, it's an offering that's for a purpose. If only the priest could eat it, it means that God lets us enter into this feast for a purpose. There's something that we are to do with this feast. In Exodus 19, which is the chapter that talks about the giving of the Torah, and I think most of you know that the giving of the Torah is linked to the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Lord called to Moses and he said, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and you tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Is there any problem with this covenant? Is it hard to obey God's voice? Have people been successful at it? We were talking about this the other day. If I were to take my jacket and pass it around to this room, what would most of you do? I say, everyone, I want you to pick up my jacket. Most of you would. Then after I had you all look at my jacket, I would say, okay, I'm going to pass my jacket around again. But this time, nobody look in the left pocket. What's everybody want to do? It's hard to obey the voice. If you think it isn't, then you don't understand human nature. Anybody that ever raised a small child, when there's a, we always had a wood stove when we lived in our other two houses. And little children are drawn to hot stoves. And what do you tell them? Don't touch the hot stove, it will hurt you. What do they do the minute you turn? They touch the hot stove. I don't, how many kids get blisters on their fingers touching the hot stove after someone told them not to? This is one of the problems that, quote, secular society has, is they think people are basically good, and people have good in them. John 1 says that Jesus, Yeshua, is the light that lights every man. You all have the light of the Lord but you have something else. You have a voice that doesn't want to hear, that wants to do the opposite thing. In fact, I, I can remember the days that we were trying to get people to come up front. So Doug did this, I've done a couple. We'd put tape in the back, so when you came in, you couldn't sit in the back. What would people do? They'd come in here and you could see their visage, their countenance change. And they'd look at those tapes and you could just see the anger seething. Who is going to tell me what to do? How does it hurt you not to sit in the back? You and I do not want to do what we're told. It's just not our nature says, I'll do what I want. And so this is a tough thing to obey his voice. And what is God going to do about that? When they came to the mountain, I think you all remember that Moses had asked God, he says, how will the people know that, that you are the one who sent me? I mean, can you, have you ever thought about this? Showing up in another country, going to the king and to the people and saying, God told me to take you out of Egypt. You know, it's a lot easier to read that than it is to imagine you are the person. But God said, this is how you'll know. You'll worship me on this mountain. So there was this promise that the mountain that God spoke to Moses, where he spoke to him, that they would come back to that mountain. We actually have a very similar thing in Acts. Yeshua talked to his disciples for that, you know, there's 50 days between the crucifixion, actually between the resurrection and Pentecost. There's 50 days. During that time, he talked about the kingdom of God for 40 days. After about 40 days, he was taken into heaven. 
and we almost find an identical statement. The Lord told Moses, you'll worship God at this mountain. The angels that were standing there when Yeshua was taken up said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Yeshua has, who has been taken up from you will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So as they were t Moses was told, you'll come back here and worship me, they were told that just the way you've watched Yeshua go up, and I would guess the place, the Mount of Olives, he will return. We find this connection. I've pondered this, and I don't, you know, what is the solution to our penchant for disobedience? Has there anyone in this room decided you weren't going to disobey and you just set your jaw and it worked? Your will is powerful and God has invested it with a lot of value in your life. But your will alone won't get the job done. In both these places, Mount Sinai and then the Mount of Olives, the Lord told them to wait. In Exodus 19, he says, get yourself ready. On the third day, I'm going to come down on the mountain and I'm going to speak to you. And when I speak to you, the people will trust Moses the rest of their lives. And Yeshua said, you stay here in Jerusalem until what? till you're clothed, they're cloaked with power from on high. How do we change our behavior based on what we know? Does, do all of you in here do everything you know to do? For instance, if you know you need to eat differently to be healthy, does that automatically mean you will? It depends on if eating healthy includes chocolate, right? Danielle shakes her head, no. What, what is the problem? If, if I write the Ten Commandments on stone on that wall and have you memorize them, will we all do the right thing from here on out? We all know the answer is no. What has to happen? The whole Feast of Shavuot is about changing the place of the voice. Because the voice outside of you brings rebellion. The voice inside of you will usually lead to obedience. And when you look at the, the new covenant and the fact that it's been changed, what's the difference in Jeremiah 31 between the old covenant and the new covenant? Is the Old Covenant, New Covenant, are they different content? It uses the same words. It uses the Torah. The New Torah, what, what it says, I'll write these where? On your heart and on your mind. Now, I've been thinking a lot about this because in following Yeshua and following Jesus, we have something we call being born again. This is where we believe and we accept that his redemption, his sacrifice has paid for our sin and we now have a new life. There's another experience that's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever stopped to think that you need both of these experiences? Because to be bad, what is the born again experience? Did you know, I'll, I'll think I've got it here. Yes, 1 Peter. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. There's a process where God plants his word in you. But out of that process, why do you plant seeds? What's the reason you plant seeds? What's the eventual? You want to harvest. How many of you have watched this field out here? I think it was three weeks ago I took a picture of that and it was dirt. What is it now? 
It's green and growing. What happened? Seeds were planted, but here's the thing. Planting a seed isn't enough. Have you ever watched what Johnny and Doug and Steve and all these guys do when they plant a field? They go through a lot of preparation. What I want to just get you thinking about today is that the bat, when you are born again, when you believe, and you know probably all of you do, when you're baptized and you say, I take Yeshua, I take Jesus as my Savior. This is being born again. A seed is planted. But unless the seed is taken care of, it doesn't bear fruit. And God has ordained it that the seed that was planted in you and this planted in everyone here, the way you tend that seed and allow it to grow is with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so when you're born again, the seed is planted. If you want to see the fruit of the Spirit, you need the tools. How many of you would like to go plant 40 acres without tractors and plows and drills, it's impossible. Sometimes I think I try to have these seeds that are in me bear fruit without having the ability to tend the seed. <laughs> it's interesting to look at all of you are fighting well, but uh, I think of Yeshua in the garden. Couldn't you bear with me for one hour? I, I told Kenneth this, uh, this morning, I came back, I milked for a little while, and I sat at my computer, and being the uh, lively young man that I am, I woke up drooling down the front of my shirt. <laughs> I was glad no one could find me looking so... <laughs> it's kind of hard to stay awake sometimes. Why? What, what makes us fall asleep? It's not bad. It's our flesh. And there's not, not a thing in the world wrong with your flesh, but if your flesh is running your life, that's wrong. Anyway, what should be, what not should be, what is coming out of our lives because we've been born again? Who can tell me what these seeds bear? Tell me one. Love is one. Tell me another one. Patience. Kindness. I have to do them in order, I forget. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I was thinking about this and putting this all together and really getting excited, and the cow kicked me. I wanted to kill her. And I thought, oops, that's not patient. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. When you're milking, if the cow kicks you once or twice, oh, it's okay. Four or five times, bazooka. And the seeds that are in us, remember what Yeshua said in John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. I don't know about you, but lately I've had a passion that when people look at me, they would see Yeshua. They would see Jesus. And the only way that will happen is if the seeds that are in me bear the fruit. Now the seed that's in you and the seed that's in me is good. It is the Lamb of God. That seed will bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, unless there's a crop failure. <laughs> Remember what Paul said? He said, Apollos planted, I watered, what? God gave the increase. God allowed it to grow. You and I cannot. We, I, I'm not going to make Dean grow in love or patience, but I can, through the gifts of the Spirit, be part of the process of planting and watering for others and for myself. And I think this has become very crucial because, you know, if I were to ask you right now, have you had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you use the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life? Because Shavuot is about the disciples. In John 20, Yeshua breathes on them and he says, receive the Spirit. So they had received the Spirit. The seed had been planted. 
But something has to happen so that the seed can bear fruit. And I, when you look at what's going on in the world today, one of the things I think all of us have noticed is there's this increase of contempt. There's this increase of division and polarization. And I, I find this within me. I, I kind of start wondering, why can't these people who disagree with me see how wrong they are? Why can't they wake up? They're so stupid. What does this breed? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? It's not. It's creating a world that is very divided. And when you look at it, Yeshua said, we're to be the salt and the light of the world. We cannot be the salt and light of the world if the seed in us is not bearing fruit. And I was convicted of this because I have been born again. I have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And yet, I find myself deficient in the harvest. The love, joy, peace, patient, kindness. It isn't that God hasn't brought some of that fruit to pass. But what did Yeshua say? He says, it's to my glory that you bear much fruit. That this become the hallmark of who you are. There's a couple of uh, passages that talk about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 is the one I mentioned that says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. And it really struck me that we have not realized how important we are to each other in bringing a harvest in our lives. How many here know that sometimes God has given you a word of encouragement and you were faithful and gave that word of encouragement and you brought nutrition, you brought fertilizer, you brought water to a seed that might have been about to die. You allowed this much closer to fruit. Now in uh, Romans 12 he talks about gifts, he talks about prophecy, teaching, all these. And 1 Corinthians 12 is the one that people always talk about. Now concerning spiritual gifts, and as Kai has pointed out many times, the Greek doesn't say concerning spiritual gifts, does it? What does it say? Now concerning spiritual. I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray. Then he goes on to say, no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Yeshua is accursed. No one can say Yeshua is a Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Then he says there are varieties of gifts. And the word here is charisma or charis. And what, what is the basis of this word? It's a gift. It's something that comes to you. You don't earn it. It is not a fruit. It's not something you plant and bring forth. It's something that is given to you. In other words, every one of you sitting here have gifts that God has given you in the Holy Spirit that are they're tools. You know, like my dad over at his old house, there's a room on the side. And go in there, and there's rakes and shovels and hoes. That's what you have from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And every one of us is going to have slightly different ones. But here's the thing that I would like to stimulate in you and me. And at one time, remember, Mark was really pushing everybody to go around and talk to people and pray to people, which makes me excessively uncomfortable. But you want to know something? If God brought somebody into your purview and that person has a seed that's dying or needs to be planted, that one of the gifts is evangelism, the ability to plant the seed. If you don't plant the seed, it doesn't get planted. If you don't water the seed. I remember Kaya going up to people on airplanes and praying for them. And me thinking, wow, that's a little too much. No, it's not. That's how this works. You have these tools in the closet that the Holy Spirit has given you. And it says, there are varieties, the same Lord, varieties of effects. Each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. One is given a word of wisdom, to another a word of knowledge, another faith, another gifts of healing, affecting of miracles, to another prophecy. And he lists all these, and these are no means, by no means exhaustive. All Paul is saying is the Holy Spirit 
has put you on the earth, given you the baptism and the new birth, so that you can take the gifts you have and stir them up in other people, water them, bring them to life, save a plant that's dying, and it takes risk. That's the part I love about it. Not so much. But if you don't believe me, let's look at some scriptural examples. I'm going to hurry this up because you are a stalwart group and I can... When the woman came to Yeshua at the well, what brought her to belief? Because Yeshua started to act in the power of the Holy Spirit. He used words of wisdom, words of knowledge. And she was, you know, he, she was trying to get religious. I love this, you know, he, he says, go get your husband. And she says, I got him. I don't have a husband. He says, I know, you've had five and you're not married to this one. She says, okay, we, we think you're supposed to worship at this mountain and Jews on that mountain because suddenly she wanted to get religious. It was getting frightening because he spoke the truth to her and it planted the seed, it watered the seed. She went into the village and said, this man told me everything I ever knew. And if you read John 4, it says, many Samaritans came to belief through her testimony because Yeshua operated in the gifts of the Spirit, brought her to life, then she took that same fervor and scattered seeds and watered seeds and brought many people to belief. Another great story in Acts 13, I think it is, yes. Sergius Paulus was a consul, and he was listening to Paul share the message. And he had a sorcerer there named Elymas. Elymas bar Jesus, I think, which means son of Jesus. And he was resisting. He didn't want Sergius Paulus to believe. He didn't like the gospel. He was fighting it. And Paul turned to him and he said, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And I love what it says next. And Sergius Paulus believed, because he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. You and I keep thinking that we have to be like Paul. We don't. We need to be like us. And I'm going to, sh I'm going to share a few here that happen right now in our lives that we see. They're going on right now. I'm going to share some that people have spoken to me that have made all the difference. But I told some of you who were here last week, we went to the Richmond Black and White show and we found out that Frank, our photographer, I mean, I had known for months that his wife was sick with Guillain-Barre and that she had been in a coma and she was just starting to wake up at they had hospital bills that were just crippling. And uh, the California Holstein delegation had passed around cards saying, we're going to have a GoFundMe so we can raise money for Frank and Kathy. And Ted Papa, George, and I admitted, I've sometimes not been real kind with Ted. I mean, he's a good guy, but he's a little arrogant. And uh, maybe I recognize that because it's too close to home. I don't know. But in any case, Ted just quietly went to the sale, and he had two in the sale, and he said, on this one, just turn all the proceeds over to Frank and his wife. And so when the heifer got up there to sell, none of us knew this, and they said, this heifer is going to be sold, and all the proceeds are going to go to Frank, and what's more, the commission has been removed. There's a 15% commission whenever you sell. And so I was just there, and just immediately, that voice... John, you buy that heifer. I don't want that heifer. She's kind of ugly. But I bought the heifer. And then I went to Ted and I said, you know, I just bought this to help Frank. I don't need this heifer. And he said, let's sell her again. So they put her through the ring again. And my friend Corey bought her this time for 2200 And he said, I don't really need a heifer either. So they sold her again. It was incredible to watch something that I really believe was this moving of the gifts of the Spirit. Just one listen, because I wasn't prepared to do this. I saw the sale guys up on the stand crying. 
I, gave, I told you Marty's a memorable line. He says, I never get this emotional unless my Aggies lose. Unless <laughs> my Aggies lose. He's a big time Utah State fan. Anyway, and it cra- I mean, and then I went over and I saw Frank later, and Frank was so moved he couldn't talk. And then uh, Craig Harris, when his jersey came through, he did the same thing. So in the life fast, we raised ten thousand dollars, and I saw with my own eyes. Frank believes, but he's hanging on with his fingernails. He's been through this months with Kathy, and Kathy's a strong believer, very strong. And she started, she's starting to wake up from this coma, and she's very depressed. And to know that people cared, that people, you just saw this thing happening. And Frank, I saw with my own eyes the watering of the seed. I saw the nurture. And it wasn't me. It wasn't Corey. It it was all of us hearing the Holy Spirit and using some tools in the toolbox. You can do that. And, and it's not always that obvious. Uh, I pulled this. I, I knew Mary had written something to me years ago that really blessed me. And I've told Mary how much this blessed me. And I don't even know if it's true. But I, I think it is. I think it's from the Lord. And uh, she says, good morning, John. This was October 10th, 2015. I always find it interesting what the Father does during a specific prayer time. As I began to pray for you, I asked the Father for the revelation that he wanted me to see, and this is what the Father said to me. John is a good, good father like me. That, you have no idea what that did for me. Not only because I knew Mary had been praying, but it was actually the word of the Lord. It was using those tools to water that seed, to strengthen that seed. And as you can tell, Mary, I've never forgotten. I've kept it. It's not a big thing. You can do it. And if you have not had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for you. Pray for yourself. Cry out to God. It's Don't leave the tools in the shed unused. I also remember many, many years ago we were having a prayer and a bunch of us were around the room on our knees, and Greg came over to me, and this is probably 35 or 40 years ago, and he laid his hands on me, and he, boy, he, he barked these words. He scared me. He says, do not shrink back. Do not pull back. And, I, and it's one of those things that, it's in my spirit. I know that if I ever sense that thing that says, ah, can I hang on? Is it worth it? I can hear that. And he, and he said something, and I wish I had written. I have this written down somewhere, and I can't find it. But he said something to the effect, don't run from the mantle that God is putting upon you. Now, if you haven't written things down like this that people said, and there was one Kai I wrote to me, and I had a hard time finding it, that was the same kind of tremendous encouragement, tremendous strengthening. It, it does, it's exactly what, 1 Corinthians 3 says, where you water the seed, you plant the seed, you prepare it. It's God that gives the increase. God gives the harvest. But he works through you and he works through me to plant these seeds. I'm ready to bring this to a close. And you know, so often when we do this, it it can feel like a raw, raw session, and you might be struggling with being tired. But you know, being tired has nothing to do with what God can do. And what I've determined I'm going to do today, do you recall when the children of Israel surrounded the mountain? God told them not to come up to the mountain until what? Until the blowing of the shofar. So what I'm going to do right now, this is how I'm going to close, I'm going to ask you to assume the posture that's receiving for you. And this is going to be different for everybody. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You might hold your hands out. You might fold your hands in your lap. 
but I'm going to blow the shofar, and I'm going to ask the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, to speak to you and give you the courage to come up to the mountain. I don't know about you, but I think we've been at a distance for too long. And I want to leave this. That's why I'm going to blow the shofar, because it, it's not me. It's whatever the Lord will say to you. I, I feel this tremendous need in me, and I think in all of us, to stir up the gifts. They're, they're there. That's the thing. I've watched all of you operate in the Holy Spirit. I, I, every one of you have built into my house. But it's time to stir it up. Did you notice how Paul, when he... When he goes, comes to the Romans, he says, I can't wait to come there so I can give you some spiritual gift. And he tells Timothy, stir up in you that gift. So I'm just going to play the shofar for a short time, and just in your mind, however the Lord would show you, ask for that step of faith to come up to the mountain so that you would hear his voice. I think of all the things that struck me as I was preparing for this, is the Lord saying, if you'll obey my voice, you'll be my people. And I, I know everyone here wants to obey his voice. So I'm going to blow the shofar, and I just pray his blessing be upon you, and that this truly can be a memorable Shavuot. Just give them a minute to set up up here. We'll go into the lamp lighting and sacrifice. 